in January 1931, a young woman arrived in Auckland to start a new job. She was a journalist, and her name was Iris Wilkinson, though she was already publishing creative work under the name Robin Hyde. Born in Cape Town, raised in Wellington, she had just turned 25 years old. Iris had worked for newspapers in Wellington, Christchurch and Whanganui, but Auckland would be her final home in New Zealand. For someone so young, Iris bore many wounds and many secrets. At the age of 18, her right knee swelled, possibly a tubercular infection. Iron splints, crutches and invasive surgeries followed. For the rest of her life, she walked with a stick. The morphine she was given began years of drug dependency. The wounds were not just physical. Seeking treatment for her leg, Iris holidayed in Rotorua at the age of 20. Her leg worsened and a short, sour love affair resulted in a pregnancy. The baby was still born in Sydney and she took part of his name, Christopher Robin Hyde, as what she called her own nom de guerre. More recently, working at the Wanganui Chronicle as lady editor, Iris had another short-lived affair, another pregnancy. I have always been punished for loving too little, she later wrote, never for loving too much. Her baby, Derek Arden Chalice, his last name and invention, was born in Picton in late October 1930. Iris smuggled him back to Wellington on the Cook Strait Ferry and placed him in a nursing home. She couldn't return to the Wanganui Chronicle because her column had been terminated. All she could do was stay at her parents' unhappy home and tell no one about Derek. The only way out of Wellington was a new job. Um, her new job was lady editor, once again, on a small Auckland weekly called The Observer. It offered four pounds a week and the chance to lead an independent life again. When she moved to Auckland early in 1931, Iris knew no one here. She'd never even seen a copy of The Observer before they offered her the job. Baby Derek, you should remember, was three months old. He was left in Palmerston North, boarding with a foster mother. Iris sent them a quarter of her pay each week. Derek was still the deepest of secrets. Iris's mother discovered the truth, but her father knew nothing. He went to his grave knowing nothing. Her employer could never know because Iris would lose her job. She missed Derek and worried about him, and worried about the debt she still owed in Whanganui and to the hospital where she gave birth. Her need to earn money and to take care of her son and her unfulfilled desire to make a home with him were the increasingly desperate imperatives of her Auckland life. Now, as we've just been discussing, we love to destroy our past in Auckland but the Observer Building is still standing on Wyndham Street, even if the paper itself is long gone. Haru can infiltrate anywhere, by the way. <laughs> the aim of the paper, Iris wrote, was to write bold and free as other papers mayn't, but certainly not to haunt divorce courts or put harassed housemaids in the headlines, like the truth. Her office, a cubbyhole next to the editor Gordon McLean's office was at the top of a long, difficult flight of stairs. Her first home in Auckland was the Burwood Boarding House on Princess Street. Harry Sweetman, the boy she loved when she was a teenager who travelled to England without her and died there, had once stayed at the Burwood. Uh, she admired Princess Street with what she called its great old English trees. But the boarding house was a dank, depressing place where even the furniture was, she said, bursting and decrepit, 
stinking of stale cigarettes and sweat. There was a hopeless, quiet dejection about it, she said. One of the other residents gave her some morphine. In her letters, Iris described Auckland as Tinseltown, a fantastic, rather theatrical place. She'd never even been to Titirangi. <laughs> For the newspaper, she wrote this. The old city is looking rather lovely, all scarlet and gold canna lilies and the tall, creamy university tower shining against the background of Albert Park. I haven't been anywhere yet except to walk three times around the windmill, which you must always do at once if you want to be lucky in Auckland. Was Iris lucky in Auckland? No. She was busy, busy, busy. Many of her landmarks in the city, like Partington Mills and the tram lines, for example, are gone. Others, like the Civic Theatre, Smith & Coe, the Town Hall, they're still standing. RSU places that we don't know anymore, perhaps, the Friends of the Soviet Union office in Courtney's building on K Road, the Communist Party headquarters on Newton Road, the Radical Bookshop on Pitt Street. She knew the little London theatre, which was a six-penny picture house, and the Peter Pan cabaret that some of you in this room may be old enough to remember as well. The Turkish baths in the Chancery buildings and cafes like the Spotted Cow on Commerce Street and Blake's Inn on Vulcan Lane. Like many journalists, Iris frequented the famous Golden Dragon restaurant on Gray's Avenue. And she knew the Chinese nationalist headquarters and the various Chinese shops, gambling dens and associations of that area one of New Zealand's largest Chinatowns. She knew all the tumble-down shacks on Grays Avenue, which she described as thin houses of a sultry, rotting darkness and old tin veranda roofs, leprous with rust. She knew the old city mission, the old Auckland city mission, and the DOS houses of the inner city, where she said, dim tossing shapes stretched out under blankets, thin and grimy as soiled paper. She knew the vagrant women and the returned soldiers wounded in body and mind. She knew Grafton Bridge, where she wrote, you look down into a gulch of smudged trees and old broken tombstones, showing their teeth through the smear of green and brown. From its highest point, she said, plenty of fellows went over Grafton Bridge and plenty of girls too. Grafton Bridge was pretty safe as a one-way ticket. Iris knew the Chinese market gardens in Kalor Park. She knew very well the Pad Orake. She knew the batches of Milford and Castor Bay. She came to know people here, including Darcy Cresswell, Frank Sargison, John A. Lee. She also knew the handful of other women employed as journalists. Before she left Auckland, Iris would also know a cell in the basement ward of Auckland Hospital and she would know Avondale Mental Hospital all too well. Ironically, it would provide her with her most stable home of the Auckland years, a safe place for her to rest and write. But this was in her future. When she published that Observer letter about Auckland, she signed it Taffy, one of the many pseudonyms Iris, like other lady editors, was expected to adopt. For the Observer, she was also Iris Wilkinson, Jennifer Larch, R.H., The Bookman, The Fretful Porcupine, and Robin Hyde. Much of her work was writing about teas and debutantes, seances and race meetings, the Lyceum Club and the Victoria League, as well as devising ad copy, 
beauty hints and reviews of books, films and plays. She described it as scraping, scraping, scraping away at your mind, frittering it away in paragraphs. She attended dances at a social, as a social reporter. You are growing old, 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 she wrote. You were decidedly not a virgin, very tired, very busy and watching youth. However, when she met a social worker, the Reverend Jasper Calder, she was able to gather material for a more serious and sensational article, Convicts in Mount Eden, about the bleak conditions in the prison. The prison chaplain, she said, told me that the authorities spent hours hunting through the files for a convict named Robin Hyde. <laughs> Iris escaped the boarding house for a small flat, which she described as a room with a folding up bed, a tin roof veranda divided into kitchenette and bathroom, but plenty of clean hot water. She moved Derek up to Auckland so she could see him more often, but he lived with foster parents, Ivy and Ben Hudson and Sandringham. She was more like an aunt than a mother, there for days out and gifts of clothing. Her responsibility was to work and earn money. Now, for the observer, she was writing paragraphs about fashionable dogs in Remuera, but she also saw the depression take hold of the city with what she described as starving, shabby, faintly complaining, intensely ordinary people. And the soldiers who returned from Gallipoli or the Somme and could no longer find work or peace of mind, Iris saw the wraith-like, unwanted, and continually humiliated men who were too shabby and too harassed to attend RSA ceremonials. So at that time, unemployment was soaring. Women like Iris had to contribute money, contribute some of her wages every week to the brand new unemployment fund. But women themselves were not eligible for relief payments. There was no income support for families until 1938. In her darkest moods, Iris found her own fears magnified in the city around her. Frightened little people, she wrote, frightened of the great steel winds pouring over the world, of being evicted, of having to pay one shilling in the pound unemployment tax, of having the banks close down on them, of being found out for having illegitimate babies of finding themselves out in dark of the early morning, finding themselves out and thinking, I don't come up to much. So this month, it is precisely 90 years since the riots in Queen Street, part of a big wave of protests across the country, April 1932. Iris's boss at The Observer joined what was called the Specials, who wore white armbands and carried batons. They were there to support the police and the military and to keep thousands of demonstrators and the unemployed from smashing the windows of Milne and Choice. They did smash them, by the way, and they nicked all the mannequins. Um, the Auckland protests began outside the town hall. There was a meeting inside, the crowd swelled, um, it spread eventually the length of Queen Street and up and along K Road. Union leader Jim Edwards rose to speak outside the town hall and he was bashed by a policeman. And that's when the violence really began. I've read that protesters armed themselves with fence palings from the Methodist Central Mission on Airedale Street. And they also armed themselves with stones from a mini golf course in Civic Square. Hundreds of shop windows were smashed and there was looting. Many people were injured or arrested or both. Jim Edwards was sentenced to two years hard labor in Mount Eden prison. I just need some wine to go on now. <laughs> Less than a year later, overworked and overtired, sick with the flu, her job at the Observer in jeopardy, 
Iris jumped off a wharf into the Waitemata Harbour. She was an alien, she thought. Everywhere she'd been in New Zealand, everywhere she'd ever lived. It was her own fault, she said. I make my own bars. So in this instance, she referred to, or she agreed to, a specific set of bars, an extramural ward in an Edwardian house on Gladstone Road at the edge of the hospital grounds. The building she called the Grey Lodge had stained glass windows, airy rooms and covered verandas. The women resident there were all suffering from what was known as nervous disorders. You may be familiar with them. And they all helped tend the gardens. The house faced west towards the main buildings of the asylum, farmland, the harbour, the Waitakere Ranges, the Waitamata Harbour and the Waitakere Ranges. One of the buildings in the asylum, Hyde said, Iris said, sorry, we call her so many things. The, one of the buildings was for returned soldiers who had lost their reason. During those first turbulent months there, she was exiled to the general ward for a time as punishment for drug smuggling. But the lodge would be her home on and off for almost four years. Before the big first lockdown, do you remember that? Haru and I visited the lodge together. We were admitted by a security guard and left to wander. The guard told us the ghosts there were benign, not like the ones in the big brick buildings of the old asylum. The place is university institutional rather than hospital institutional now, but the banisters are original. This was another job for the residents, polishing the banisters and floors. Iris hated what she called the mop and polish laws, the way the beds creaked, the sluggish mentality behind the huddle into which women patients went. She saw her fellow residents as at the most critical point in their lives, the place where they could think before they went on. Oversensitive to noise, Iris loathed the building's loudspeaker and blaring radio. She couldn't sleep without medication and worried about money for Derek's maintenance. And as I said, she was sent back to the main ward for drug smuggling because her drug dependency continued. It was a year until her psychiatrist, Dr. Gilbert Tothill, eventually a friend and an ally, persuaded her to start writing a memoir as writing therapy. Iris's refuge in the lodge was the attic, where she was allowed to work at her typewriter. The only furniture was a table and a bench. She had no fire up there, just what she said was a shut door and a flight of steep steps below and up with me spiders and an occasional starling. As well as sole access to the attic, Iris was given the only private bedroom in the lodge and her own small patch of garden. I came to this asylum of yours, she wrote, not because I was mad, but because I needed madness if I were to survive. Gladstone Road, as you may know, is now Carrington Road and the trams Hyde Court along New North Road into the city are gone. There was one at the very beginning, remember, Avondale to Parnell. She was permitted to travel into town to conduct interviews and have meetings, researching her articles and books at the public library. In 1935, Reverend Frank Morton described her as a slight woman with an interesting face and a lame leg who swung into my office on a walking stick. Her tattered lameness, as she described it, was the bedraggled standard Iris carried everywhere, including in 1938 to the front line in China after Japan's invasion. So in Auckland, Derek's foster father lost his job. The Hudsons moved to a railways department work camp in Hawke's Bay. Most of Iris's communication with them was about money. Between Derek's second birthday and his fifth, Iris wrote, I never saw him. Instead, she wrote and wrote and wrote. 
In 1935, Macmillan in London published her poetry collection, The Conquerors. That was her second published poetry collection. Iris was already hard at work in the attic at Grey Lodge. As well as the informal memoir suggested by her doctor, uh, he suggested she write journalese, which was a, a compilation of many of her journalistic pieces. This was written and published in 1934 by another London publisher, Hurst and Blackett. They published all the books she wrote in Auckland. The historical novel, Check to Your King, which is Haru's favourite, published in 1936 along with Passport to Hell, one of the great World War I books. Its sequel, Nor the Years Condemn, was written in Auckland and published when Iris was in Shanghai. Many of the girlhood memories she wrote down for Dr. Tothill were reshaped into her most famous novel, The Godwits Fly, published in 1937. That same year, she published the fantasy novel, Wednesday's Children, and the poetry collection, Persephone in Winter. A friend remembered Iris Wilkinson as a woman for whom work came first, she said. It was her main task in life. The door to the attic is green and tattooed with graffiti, Haru warned me about the stairs because they are alarmingly narrow and tall, especially for someone with enormous feet like mine. Um, they must have been very difficult for Iris to negotiate. The attic view now is treetops in the city with just glimpses of the harbour. The room is dusty and bare, humming with a central air unit. But we both felt very close to her in this plain space. The shape would have been familiar to her, the quiet, after I edged back down the stairs, I left Haru alone in the house, apart from the ghosts, of course, waiting for the light to turn. Iris Wilkinson lived in Auckland for seven years, and then she sailed away to China and to Britain at the beginning of 1938. The last time Derek talked with his mother, it was in the Auckland domain. The last time he saw Iris, it was on the wharf saying goodbye to the ship. He was seven years old. His foster father, Ben Hudson, died of kidney failure the following month. From China, Iris wrote a letter to Derek that he did not see until 1995. My dearest little Derek, she wrote, I hope you won't get this little note, but if you do, it means that Mother Iris can't come back to you however much she would like to. At that time, Iris was on the front line and she was worried she would be killed by a Japanese bomb. So she survived China, but not London. Just before the outbreak of World War II, Iris died of benzodrine poisoning. The note she left was signed both Iris Wilkinson and Robin Hyde. The day she left Grey Lodge, she wrote, that she didn't look backwards at the attic windows, though there, unless they burn the place down or blow it up, a face will dwell forever, my own face looking out. Almost 90 years on, whenever I pass that building, I look for her. Hara and I dedicate tonight's performance, our presentation, to the late Derek Chalice and to his wife, Lynn.